Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second episode of Simpol Insights, a series of interviews with today's leading thinkers in the field of civilization design, collective intelligence, and conscious evolution. In a world confronted with global warming, pandemics, increasing inequality, and political polarization, Simpol Insights in aims to bring light to the darkness and chart a course towards a cooperative global society. Today, we're very lucky to have Oxford University Professor of Globalization and Development, Professor Ian Golden. He is the founder of the Oxford Martin School, the, world, the world's leading center for inter interdisciplinary research into critical global challenges, bringing together international leaders from government, business, academia, media, and civil society to address the growing short-term preoccupations of modern politics and business, and identify ways of overcoming today's gridlock in international negotiations. Welcome, Professor. Pleasure. Your book came out uh, a couple of months ago, um, which means that you presumably wrote it in the midst of the pandemic, uh, which must have been an interesting experience. Um, with regards to global health, you write that cooperation and preparedness are the watchwords for the 21st century. Why is it so hard to tackle pandemics such as the COVID-19 crisis without global cooperation? Well, terra incognita, um the subtitle of which is 100 Maps to Survive the Next 100 Years, looks at the reasons why we have these major global challenges. And um, pandemics are particularly complex because they're the only challenge we face that requires all countries in the world uh, to be engaged in the solution. And there's no wall high enough that will keep out a pandemic. There's indeed no wall high enough that will keep out climate change or any of the other great threats we face. Um, it's a mystery to me why countries continue to spend about a thousand times more on their militaries and preparing for past wars rather than what we and all the intelligence agencies uh, agree uh, no, is the greatest threat we face, which is pandemics. Um, so cooperation is needed. Uh, clearly, during the Second World War, this was recognized uh, that that should be the war to end all wars. And the international system was built in the fires of that war. Uh, we need to learn the same today. We need to recognize that we can only be as safe and secure as uh, citizens are elsewhere. and that we need to manage globalization uh, by cooperating. Um, just how bad is the threat of climate change? It's, uh, I think, potentially catastrophic. Um, David Attenborough talks about this as an extinction event. Um, and I think that's correct over time uh, because of the reinforcing tipping points that are likely to occur. Um, things like the release of methane from the tundra, the melting of the uh, ice caps, stopping reflection back, um, the ocean collapse, meaning that it's unable to accept, uh, absorb carbon dioxide, the destruction of forests, meaning they are uh, less able to absorb carbon dioxide. So I think we very quickly escalate from two degrees to four degrees. And um, these are average temperatures for the whole planet, which means that there are many places which see, um, and we depict this in terra incognita, see temperatures which are way beyond. Uh, we very quickly move to a world of rising oceans. Most of the growth uh, and most of the global economy is in coastal cities. Um, and um, Miami, parts of London, Mumbai, Jakarta, um, many places basically come underwater, even those places that aren't suffer from saline uh, in intrusion. And um, the, the ecosystem of the world, I think, becomes rather unstable. Uh, wealthy people, uh, are likely to be able to survive in their cocoons. Um, as we see in the US, the most rapidly growing cities are like Phoenix and Las Vegas uh, can be in the deserts. People can survive in 40 degree uh, temperatures in deserts if they have enough money, if they can keep the air conditioning going all the time and pump water from further and deeper. 
But for 99% of the world's population, that's not an option. Uh, and so this will exacerbate inequalities, exacerbate suffering. Um, and we have to act immediately to stop that. St. Paul's approach to problems like climate change is very much based in game theory. So as far as we see it, nations aren't acting on climate change because of the first mover problem. So if a country goes yeah. first and acts responsibly, then they get penalised either by their voters, and as in the case of Macron's fuel tax and the Gilets Jaunes protest, or because it makes their country less competitive to international business. Do you agree with that analysis? And how do you think we can get out of the game theoretical trap of destructive competition between nations? Well, I think um, Simpel's approach uh, does draw on those very valuable insights, prisoner dilemma, game theory type insights, problems of first mover, that everyone is better off if you come to an agreement, but no one wants to make the agreement because in the short term, it might involve some sacrifice. And particularly in democracies where we have short termism in political cycles, companies short termism with uh, profits and returns to shareholders increasingly driven by quarterly reports and other short term drivers, we see uh, this challenge of doing the right thing in the long term uh, can involve short term sacrifice. Um, that's why people need to act together. That's why we need rules and regulations which create a framework where everyone is going to be penalized in the same way in the short term for everyone's longer term uh, benefit. Um, most global challenges, and certainly climate change is amongst them, don't require everyone in the world, or all companies in the world, or all countries in the world, uh, to agree simultaneously. In the case of climate, uh, a dozen or so players could solve 80% of the problem, 500 companies, uh, 12 countries. And uh, so the Pareto principle, where 20% of the actors can create 80% of the solution, and can create widening circles of agreement is, I think, important. Though, but those countries need to act simultaneously. Uh, if African countries, for example, do things later um, and are not part of the immediate solution, that would not stop our efforts to be successful on climate change in the short term. Uh, but the key players, the US, Europe, China, uh, need to act immediately and simultaneously. Uh, so it is, I think, very instructive. Pandemics, interestingly enough, are the exception. Uh, they are the only threat we face where absolutely everyone has to be part of the solution immediately. Uh, because a pandemic can come from anywhere. We've seen them come from China, but they can come from Sierra Leone, certainly come from rich countries too. Um, and that means that pandemics really do I think, um, provide an example of St. Paul's view that we are only as good as uh, everyone else is in terms of our solutions. And that's why everyone needs to come to it simultaneously. St. Paul's methodology for driving um, the first kind of particularly democratic countries to the negotiating table, at least having a kind of uh, stick to enforce that they stick to those agreements as opposed to you know Trump signing up and then leaving a few years later with no consequences um, is by leveraging national politicians desire to get elected. So the idea is that if they don't enact the simple agreement, they lose the sort of simple voting block at the next election. Um, and you can even get you can even um, incentivize local candidates to sign up um, because in a marginal election, they don't want to lose the voting block of the simple voters, and that actually drives them to sign up to simple. Um, do you think something like that might work? And and what what difficulties do you think um, it might encounter? Well, I think it's it's important that citizens hold their politicians accountable, um, and that's much easier in democracies. Uh, although we've seen um, we're seeing every day. Uh, that citizens can vote for surprisingly bad choices um, when it comes to policy and surprisingly short-term and destructive uh, choices. And so I think the first stage of this is that citizens need to be better informed about the threat. And indeed, that was the whole purpose behind Terra Incognita, was to create a book of visualizations 
which would um, highlight the choices we face in a very stark and clear way. A lot of people find it difficult to digest columns of numbers, <laughs> reams of paper, um, understandably so. Uh, but I think you know, maps and images do, do speak to that. So citizens need to be clear in their own minds what the stark choices we face are. And that's the starting point. And even in countries which aren't democratic, as we've seen in Belarus uh, recently, but we've seen in the Black Lives Matter protests, as we've seen in the spread of um, media campaigns like the Me Too movement, um, the protest movements that uh, Greta Thunberg has ignited, um, Extinction Rebellion and others. Uh, we People are becoming aware uh, and so there are many ways in which this is articulated. And I think Simpol, by trying to hold politicians accountable, uh, certainly adds to that pressure and is an important one. Uh, but all of these different approaches are needed. And of course, the key question is what do we do with non-democracies? Um, and my view is that we cannot uh, simply isolate them. Uh, that's not good for their own people, and it's not going to provide the solutions. Uh, so we need to work with them too. And and the fact that President Xi in China has been the first leader uh, to announce for a big country a move to zero carbon ambitiously, uh, uh, I think gives us hope. Um, you know, <laughs> they recognize. Um, and one advantage of an autocracy is that the leaders are in power for a very long time and are accountable for things over a very long time. And that means that they too have a legacy that they ne really need to worry about. Um, and so I think we do see the potential and we need to do it in things like trade as well. Should we be counting the carbon of the goods that we import, uh, just like we should be on whales and of uh, exotic species, we should, I think, be doing this with other global things. So through our consumption, we can vote. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why globalization needs to be strengthened, not weakened, uh, is because the more that we are integrated as companies, as consumers, uh, as the more we are able to influence decisions taken elsewhere, even in countries that don't have democratic decision making. Yeah, you, you mentioned in the book um, that we need to reset globalization. I think globalization for a lot of people has become a bit of a dirty word. Um, mm. What are, what are uh, for, at least to you, a couple of the most valid and powerful criticisms of globalization as it has, you know, as it is, and, and how can we reset it so that it benefits people more evenly? Well, globalization, by which I mean the flows across national borders of goods, of services, um, of finance, of people, most importantly of ideas, uh, has been the biggest force for progress the world has ever seen. And if we see the progress in the world since the 1980s, which is when globalization, these flows accelerated due to the uh, end of the Soviet Union with the fall of the Berlin Wall, the opening of China, trade uh, and financial restrictions being reduced, um, and the creation of the European Union, which brought the countries of Europe together, NAFTA in North America. There's never been a process in the history of humanity which has brought more progress to more people more quickly than this. And that's why I believe in it. Uh, it's lifted more people out of poverty. It's brought more vaccines and health. It's brought more girls' education. It's brought more, more, brought more gender equality. It's brought progress more rapidly to more people. But these same connecting forces uh, bring immense dangers. We're seeing it in the pandemic, but we saw it 12 years ago in the financial crisis, the super spreading of a financial contagion. We're seeing it in cyber viruses. We're seeing it as well in the unintended consequences of progress. It's great that a billion more people have access to energy and uh, they have fridges for the first time. They have health for the first time. Girls can study at night. 
because they have electricity for the first time in their homes. But that same force is what's brought an escalation of climate change um, and increased carbon dioxide emissions and greenhouse gases. It's great that so many people have access for the first time to antibiotics. That's improved health immeasurably. Average life expectancy has improved by 15 years uh, since this acceleration of globalization around the world. And that's wonderful uh, for people, but it's bringing the risk of antibiotic resistance. Now, the answer is not to stop globalization because we want to stop pandemics, we want to stop financial crisis, we want to stop fake news, we want to stop um, antibiotic resistance. We cannot ban antibiotics everywhere or ban the internet to stop fake news, uh, ban financial flows to stop financial con contagion, ban airlines and airports because we want to stop pandemics, uh, ban energy growth because we want to stop carbon emissions. That would be to set humanity and particularly the lives of poor people back immeasurably. What we need to do is regulate this. We need to control it. And it's all within our power. Uh, we can transfer to clean energy uh, through solar, through wind, through other means, uh, through an ambitious program, uh, which will create jobs through a green transition. We can regulate the use of antibiotics so they're only given uh, when they absolutely need to be. We can stop pandemics by having a rapid response force um, in all countries of the world by investing much more in vaccines. The World Health Organization, which is the institution tasked with this, gets less money than the US Coast Guard. Um, than a major hospital in Europe or the US. That's the institution that's meant to be safeguarding global health. Um, the international institutions have been starved of the resources, of the people, of the reform mandates, which they urgently need, of the legitimacy, of the power to intervene in our national economies. So we, as countries, including the, those of us in the UK, the UK, our governments are responsible for the problem of the failure to manage globalization because we're not empowering supranational institutions to manage it. We need to subject ourselves, whether it's on climate change or whether it's on health or whether it's on finance uh, or on, in other areas, we need to subject ourselves to international rules. Uh, we need to accept that with global connectivity comes global responsibility. We need to accept that the lives of those in Africa or India or elsewhere are intertwined with ours. Um, and we need to accept that this hyper interconnectivity brings a new responsibility to all of us to be aware of what we're doing around the world and how our lives elsewhere affect ours and ours affect them. Uh, and until we do that, we can't manage globalization. So. There's a huge agenda of more effective management. I don't believe this requires everything being managed by Big Brother internationally. That would be a nightmare. Um, and it's not a globalization I would embrace. We need to apply the subsidiarity principle. Whatever can be managed locally should be managed locally. And I mean within a town or a village I mean, within our own communities, within our own homes, all the way up uh, to at the global level. And most things, virtually everything can be managed locally or nationally, but some things cannot be. And certainly the rules around these very risky dimensions to globalization, um, like contagion, like climate change, like pandemics, um, need to be managed at a much higher level. And it's that understanding of what can we manage locally, what can we manage regionally, what can we, what needs to be managed, what's what's public and what's private. Companies could do much more. Um, NGOs could do much more. Citizens in different ways, cities uh, collaborating can do much more. So I'm not, this is not a call for global government. <laughs> that is not something that we need or should have. This is a call for understanding our hyper integration and how to manage uh, this complex system that we've created. Um, whether it's on the environment 
or whether it's in finance or whether it's in health, uh, it can be done. Uh, it just needs to be done. Yeah, simple ourselves, we make a big distinction between sort of global governance and global cooperation. You know, we're also not pushing yeah. for a sort of world government. We just want the world, you know, the governments that exist to have the framework within which they can cooperate fruitfully. Um, and we also we also employ the principle of subsidiarity as well. We absolutely don't want to have any decisions being made at a global level that can't be made at a national level. And I was I was going to ask you about that as well, actually. Um, just one more issue that I'd like to touch on, uh, which I think is related to all of this, um, which is inequality. And you make the nuanced point, which is, um, uh, you know, that inequality between countries um, is actually falling. It's just inequality within certain particularly developed countries is is getting um, uh, particularly stretched out. Um, how do you think that plays into or how do you think a game theoretical dynamic exacerbates that and how can global cooperation perhaps reduce some of the extremes of multi-billionaires um, at one end and people who are starving at the other? Inequality is a complex topic and we, we focus on and provide a lot of images um, related to it um, in terra incognita, including images of the sky at night and land at night which shows this extraordinary difference, for example, in energy inequality, um, where cities with the same population of New York in Africa are barely visible um, at night. So uh, inequality has multiple dimensions, health, energy, uh, income, and income is extremely important, but certainly not the, the only one. Um, and it is the case that for globalization has by accelerating the growth of developing countries, reduced inequality between countries um, for a long period of time. The pandemic is actually reversing that uh, because we are seeing that uh, the rich countries have been able to support their citizens in ways uh, um, and manage the pandemic in ways that are simply impossible in poorer countries. And so we're seeing a much more rapid collapse in growth in development. And we will see many millions of more people dying of hunger than will die of COVID-19 around the world. Uh, and this is a, a huge challenge, but it also points to a, a failure uh, to, to address it. Um, because the rich countries have given over 10% of their economies to support their firms and their people um, in managing uh, COVID-19 through furlough schemes, through stopping bankruptcies of firms, et cetera, um, have given less than 1% of that to developing countries. So actually aid to, to developing countries is gonna go down in 2020 uh, because it's calculated as a share of the size of the economy, rich e countries' economies. And because that's going down, even those countries that are giving 0 0.7, like the UK, will be giving less money um, in th this year when it's needed more desperately uh, than others. So one way to address uh, this growth in inequality is by bigger transfers. We need to give more money and we need to make more money available through international institutions as well, like the World Bank, the IMF, and the regional development banks, they are being absolutely stymied um, at present. So less than $100 billion will go to development this year, uh, when over $10 trillion is, is being dedicated by the rich countries to address their own challenges. But inequality will be growing in rich countries as well as in poor countries. Um, and we're seeing, as people increasingly work remotely, a very strong differential between those people that can work re remotely, like you and me, uh, and those that cannot. And it's very closely correlated with incomes. Uh, poor paid people, gig workers and others tend to have to be at work. Uh, and that is increasing insecurities. It is also intergenerational inequality, which is emerging with elderly people holding on to jobs and incomes at the expense of younger people. And this is perverse, given that younger people are making the biggest sacrifice uh, in terms of their incomes, their job expectations, their education, uh, rather like in the world wars, making the sacrifice for the whole 
of society, in this case, trying to protect elder people because the chance of a young person dying of COVID-19 is less than being killed by lightning. Um, so they're protecting older people and, um, and we need to give back for that. So in terms of what can be done, uh, this is a failure of globalization that needs to be addressed. Um, rich individuals are avoiding tax uh, by becoming resident in tax havens. Rich companies, including companies, um, the big tech companies, are paying a tiny fraction of what they should be uh, in taxes. And, we, and we've just seen this revelation that Donald Trump is paying, has paid less taxes uh, than a nurse. Uh, a poorly paid nurse has, uh, in fact, much less, $780 for two years over a 10-year period. Um, so that sort of tax loopholes, the tax arbitrage, the tax evasion uh, needs to be stopped. Uh, people need to pay a fair share of it. And if globalization is going to work and be sustainable, it needs to be on the basis of people not basically super riding the wave of globalization uh, to avoid taxes at the corporate and at the individual level. Uh, I think we're also going to need higher levels of tax, uh, much higher levels of inheritance taxes, of wealth taxes, um, because a lot of inequality is inherited inequality. Um, the, the ability of individuals from poor households to escape poverty, the US dream that anyone can become a president. It's just a fantasy uh, because you need a billion dollars to become president in the US. You need $10 million to be a congr Congress person. In the UK, inherited inequality and inherited is a major impediment to overcoming inequalities. And that's not only true of individuals and families, it's true of institutions as well, including my own uh, Oxford. We are able to withstand this crisis of the pandemic much better than poor universities because we have such a big war chest of endowment uh, compared to other institutions. And we have a wonderful alumni group that can sustain us uh, through donations at this time. So all of these areas require, are what governments need to worry about because the individuals that are wealthy will not be. And I think we will see um, as we saw after the Second World War, that this sacrifice gets translated into a call for greater solidarity, greater transfers within countries and between them. In the fires of the Second World War, the international system was built of solidarity. United Nations, uh, Bretton Woods institutions, welfare state, and Marshall Plan. These were all about redistribution. And unlike the First World War, this was not about uh, recrimination, about austerity. It was about solidarity within countries and between countries. And that's my view, the only way uh, to deal with this. And of course, creating opportunity. Uh, so you've got to grow your economy. You've got to grow your jobs. You've got to make sure that people are educated, get a job. Uh, and that's going to require a very different type of operating system uh, going forward. Yeah, I've heard sort of, um, you know, the, the pandemic and climate change and sort of the upheavals, the social unrest that we've seen recently is described as the kind of birthing pangs of a global civilization in some way. Um, mm. Which, you know, well, ho hopefully that's the case. Hopefully it's a precursor mm. to the emergence of, you know, mm. a truly united species. Um, why are people losing faith in democracy and um, are they right to do so? Are some of those criticisms valid? Um, and, and how do you think the issue of um, you know, global cooperation or lack thereof might be fueling that somewhat? I think people are losing faith in democracy uh, because it's not doing what it's meant to do for them. It's not giving them healthier, better, lives uh, and it's been accelerated since the financial crisis uh, of 12 years ago because that was an incredible demonstration in the biggest democracies in the US, in Europe, in the UK, uh, that governments and the experts didn't know what was going on. Uh, they couldn't manage the system and many people lost their jobs and became worse off. 
Um, and it's that anger about the failure of the elites uh, to look after people, uh, to care about them, uh, which in my view has given birth to populism and this lack of faith. And we're seeing it again now um, over recent years. I don't believe we would have Brexit in the UK. The populists across Europe or President Trump in the White House, if it hadn't been for the financial crisis. It reflects a failure of the system uh, of, uh, that had developed to deliver the goods and to deliver better prospects. And clearly um, anxieties regarding pandemics and climate change, terror and others uh, heighten them. And that's why I totally understand people's calls for protectionism and nationalism. I disagree with them fundamentally because I think it's a myth to think that by creating a higher wall, you'll be safer. Um, but I understand or that you'll have a job in the future that is going to lead to the strengthening of your economy and your society. It's going to do the opposite. It's going to undermine it. But I understand those calls. They're logical calls in the sense that they are a real response to a failure to manage open societies, um, more democratic societies. And so the challenge, I think, for those of us that believe in democracy, that believe uh, in globalization, in open societies and in progress uh, of different types, is to create a system uh, which delivers for everyone, where white workers in the north of England or in the Midwest of the US or the north of France feel they have a future uh, in society, that they're not being marginalized, that they have a job, that their incomes aren't going to be lower than their parents. And that's true of many people across society. And when you ask those, as you see in the surveys, why do you support these populists, these extremists? Why are you supporting authoritarians? It's because of the, the sense of failure of the alternatives. Um, it's wrong. It's not going to deliver the goods. But the onus is on those that believe that the system that they have is better to is to demonstrate that it's better, uh, to come up with a credible plan. And the cooperation story is central to this because we have to demonstrate why being connected is better than being disconnected. Why um, it's so dangerous to disconnect, why it leads to a downward spiral of slowing economic growth, slowing progress and rising risk, which it does. But it's not always obvious. The best example for me is actually the European Union, because it's the only example I know where countries have willingly given up things which have always been regarded as fundamentally central to the nation state, defense policy, foreign policy, control over trade, control over people movement. And every one of the 27 countries of Europe have given this up to Brussels and they're much better off for it. There's not a single country in Europe which I believe could say they're poorer because they've done it or they have less security or less influence in foreign policy globally, or are less able to deal with the great challenges we face, be they pandemic or climate or finance or other. And that's why Europe is such an important example. And that's why I believe that Brexit's been such an error uh, for the UK, which will make the UK poorer, weaker and less influential globally less able to make a difference uh, in a cooperative solution. But the UK will have to forge its own way and demonstrate why being a single small country, it's going to have to uh, be able to exercise a bigger influence than it did before. And that puts a responsibility on those in power to do it. Um, and if we don't do it, we give strength to those that argue democracy is not delivering what we need. Uh, and clearly China's success in this is the counter example. It's been spectacularly effective at lifting the incomes of its people. It's been spectacularly effective at dealing, not in the short term, but in the medium term, 
with the pandemic. Uh, and in the end, the proof of the uh, pudding on systems is in the eating. We have to demonstrate that we can do it better. Now, there are many autocracies, you know, from North Korea to Russia uh, to others who've been spectacularly bad for their citizens, uh, who are presiding over a um, collapsing economy uh, and where people are life expectancy on other measures is going down dramatically. Uh, so it's not that democracy, that autocracies are better. It's that no one system is better, it seems. That there are many autocracies which have been effective in managing COVID and managing progress, uh, and many that have been a disaster. And the same can be said of democracies. The US and the Brazil are spectacular examples of the failure to manage uh, COVID democracies, strong democracies. Um, and in Europe, if you look across Europe, you know, Greece has been incredibly effective, less than 300 deaths. Well, the UK has had 300 deaths in half a day at the height of the pandemic. Um, so difficult to argue that one system has been better than another in delivering jobs or delivering safety and security. And that's why the onus is on our governments uh, to demonstrate that we are actually a superior system because we deliver better results for ourselves and for the world. You write in the book that overpopulation isn't something uh, that we should be too concerned with. Um, and, you know, particularly when discussions about climate change it often seems to be front and center. Um, and certainly the argument that um, you know, overpopulation is driving climate change has also been, you know, uh, has also been, uh, you know, accused of being quite a racist critique. Um, so why why shouldn't we worry about po overpopulation? And um, uh, yeah. Well, in Terra Incognita, um, we summarize the arguments that are made in my book, Is the Planet Full? Uh, and the, the answers are, are slightly nuanced, but I think very important. Uh, it's not about how many people they are. People do. That's the bottom line. Uh, New York State consumes more energy and produces more carbon emissions than the whole of sub-Saharan Africa. Um, it, it's about what countries do. Um, and as countries are able to not only, countries with high populations are able to go to zero carbon, for example, because they make the right decisions. Um, and countries with high populations also might have very low carbon emissions because they just don't have the energy. 700 million people in Africa have no energy grid. Um, and so, and the same is true on other risks like antibiotic resistance. New York State consumes more antibiotics than the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, we've also seen that although people imagine that there's a continuing population explosion, uh, we're about the time in history where there's peak births. In fact, over half the countries of the world have collapsing fertility and far below replacement levels, including Europe, including much of East Asia, certainly China, but not because of the one child policy, uh, Korea, uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan and Japan have lower fertility rates than mainland China, uh, but they all have that. As incomes go up, uh, fertility comes down sharply. We've seen Iran, for example, where uh, families that were one of seven uh, would have one child on average, or 1.3 on, on average. Even in Latin America, very strangely, very Catholic countries, um, have very low fertility. Um, in Europe, Poland, Hungary, uh, competing with Italy uh, to in terms of being the world's lowest fertility rates, but also Germany. These are dramatically contracting populations. So the, the population of Europe, for example, is likely to be a third smaller uh, in a generation to come than it is today. China has 4 million less workers this year than last year. The only real big growth 
uh, in terms of population is Africa, where fertility rates are high in four countries, not across Africa. It's really an issue around four countries. And even those, including Ethiopia, are coming down dramatically. Uh, so the question for those countries where there's still rapid population growth is what choices are they going to make on the things that matter, like energy? Can they go straight to renewables, completely emitting the stage of fossil fuel use? Um, this is extremely important in India, too. Uh, as more and more people come onto the grid, can they go straight to zero carbon? Can we manage antibiotics in a way that will allow more people to take them without having global antibiotic resistance? And that's going to require people in Europe and the US and China taking much less antibiotics and us stopping giving antibiotics to animals. We, over half of antibiotics go to animals. Um, food is a vital part of the story as well. And we really know that we can intens intensify food production um, if we do it in the right way. You know, uh, Holland is the second biggest food exporter of many foodstuffs in the world on its tiny bit of land grown hydroponically, in fact, basically indoor factories, food factories. Um, we could turn our parking lots into urban food factories and feed ourselves. We're not going to run out of food. In fact, food prices have gone down over the last 30 years while population growth has gone up, real food prices. Um, the question is, are we going to destroy the planet uh, in creating the food? And there, uh, our choice of, of what we eat becomes important. Um, I believe we should be eating much less meat uh, for reasons which are to do uh, not only with animal welfare and what one thinks about the ethics of killing meat, uh, but for carbon emissions and for our own health. And so you can go through the different aspects of why population growth matters. Um, and I believe in none of them will you find that more people leads to more problems. Indeed, I believe. Uh, if every person has a brain, uh, a creative ability, and an ability to help us solve problems. And the ki real key is, can we educate people? Uh, can we connect them? Can we allow the collective creativity of humanity to increase as the number of people increases? And I believe there's every reason why we should have hope in that. Why shouldn't the next Einsteins and Shakespeare's and Mozart's be coming from the streets of Soweto or Mumbai, as they used to come from the streets of Vienna. And that is my view of population growth. It's about uh, managing it. It's about allowing the creativity that comes from it to be harvested and managing the bads. And a lot of that comes down to those that are talking about the problem, who are most concerned about it, which is, tends to be the people in the rich countries. Uh, who already have it, you want to say to them, "What do you not want grandchildren? Do you feel you have the right to grandchildren and somewhere someone else doesn't have that right? Do you think you have the right to consume like you do and somewhere else, someone else, someone else doesn't have that right? It's about are we prepared to play, apply the same standards to ourselves that we want to apply through this to others? And that's why uh, I think people rightly say, a lot of the people posing these questions have an implicit colonial or racist agenda in it, which is the problem is somewhere else. The problem is those people over there, and it tends to be in Africa or in India, those dark skinned people um, who are the problem. The problem isn't us. And actually, the problem is us. It's our lifestyles. It's our consumption of carbon. It's our consumption of meat. It's our consumption of antibiotics. That's a big part of the global problem. And if we want other people to apply different consumption habits, let's start with ourselves. Yeah, I absolutely couldn't agree more. And I love that.
point about the connection between sort of cooperation and creativity that actually you know so much of humanity has been held back from expressing their full creative potential and if we can find a way to reset globalization as you say um and to balance out some of those inequalities and to provide everyone with a decent standard of living then then who knows the creative potential that might be unleashed um from some of these places in the world that haven't had access to education or haven't had access to modern medicine and all the rest of it um so i'd just like to take this moment to say thank you very much um your book, Terra Incognita, 100 Maps to Survive the Next 100 Years, is hugely comprehensive um, and it speaks precisely to all those issues that we at Simpol care about most. And I think, you know, for us, when we when we read a book like that, it's like sort of a, a massive relief to know that we're not the only person sort of banging these particular drums. Um, and uh, I thoroughly recommend everyone to go and read it or, or even listen to it. I listened to it on Audible. Um, actually, the guy reading it was really good. Not often when he you is listen. good. Yeah. The best of all my books, I think. But it is a it's a very visual book <laughs> full of maps and color plates and things. So, you know, although it's a great guy reading it, I think it's a book that you really want to be looking at. <laughs> yeah, and actually, to be honest, I was I was aware as I was reading it that I was really missing out um, on the on that visual aspect. Um, and I'm just going to finish with a quote from it, actually, which I really liked. Um, Our generation holds the future of civilization and indeed life on Earth in its hands. And I think that call to responsibility, um, that the things that we say, that the actions that we take as 21st century, particularly Western citizens, has consequences and that um you know much like a much like a, a child going through adolescence we need now to you know become much more responsible global citizens um and i think your book is an excellent start on that journey so thank you so much professor and and good luck with all your work and good luck to simple and good luck to you thank you very much thank you